People, all phones away unless you're recording the class. And I think we have one person recording. Phones away, minds and hearts open up the entire Okay, amazing. So first of all, sorry about yesterday. How was it? Was it okay? Okay, I just needed to be at another seminary. So I have to take the morning off. So let's sort of try to get back into this mimer of Ani Ludaidi, the author of his mimer for the month of El. And we started by saying, Ani Ludaidi, I am I to my beloved, the Daidi Lia, my beloved is to me. And of course, if we first say Ani Ludaidi, which is really out of character, usually it says the other way around, Daidi Lia, Ani Ludaidi. So in this case, the Al Rebbe wants to point out, Ani Ludaidi, that in the month of El, it is the concept of Isarusa Dele. Hata, which, which means what? Arousal An arousal from below. from below. That I need to show interest. There's something that I'm going to need to do. This concept of shuva is my personal work. Now, what happens is, is that then it continues into the daidili. Right? There's a reciprocation. Where Hashem comes and He gives a revelation. And what is the main revelation of the month of Elul? First he says, number one, Malchus, right? We know Rosh Hashanah is when we're going to crown Hashem as our king. The concept of Malchus, is we, we said, is what? To develop what? What's kingship? What do, what? The fury to come. Good. Or Yira, right? Yira as the foundation to this relationship, as the commitment to the relationship, right? And we said that um, it's almost like Hashem allows us. He, he shines a light on our, on our soul, on our neshama, so that the, our soul's antennas, Right, can now feel that godly vibe that is being shown onto us, and from that space we have the koyach, the energy to be mikabel ol malchus shamayim, which means to receive the yoke of heaven. heaven, because that's number one in any relationship is commitment. Okay, so that is that. Now we said when is the main? I'm just I'm just running through what we did till now. Okay, where is the main time of that revelation? We said Elul is more like, right, the king is in the field. We're going to get to that. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is where Hashem really comes and gives him his galos, which means a, what's his galos? Revelation, right? Okay, amazing. So that, at that point, it's where the Yid, the Jew, has this, the, is driven to accept Hashem as his king. Now we went on to say that, right, we said um, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is smoyle le tachas le his left hand is holding the head, the yamine techapkeni, and we're more talk, focusing now on the left hand, which we said again, left is? Gevura. which is? Yira, which is commitment. Okay, great. Now, this is where the Altarab starts asking a question, and the question is, one second, it seems like most of what's going on over here is an arousal from above. It's Arusa de Leila. The king comes out to us. He's revealing so much to us. He's allowing us, right? He's shining the light on our neshama so that we can get in touch with who we truly are and return to ourselves. Isn't that a Sarusa de Leila? Where is, this, the, where is the arousal from below? And of course, very uh, common in Jewish practice is that whenever we want to answer a question, we ask a, another question. Another question. And the, uh, the next question that the Alter Rebbe asks is, why, if Elul has such a great revelation, and he said it's the revelation of the 13 attributes of compassion. It has a super, super energy in this month. 13 attributes of Rachmanut. 13 attributes of compassion. Why on earth is Elul the days of mundane? It's not a Yantiv, it's not a Shabbos, it's weekday. We know Right? If you look at Judaism, if you look at Yiddishkeit, whenever there's an extra level of revelation, automatically what happens? We get elevated to another space. And if that's the case, like Shabbos and Yantif, we abstain from being mundane. We don't work. We don't do all the 39 melachos, right? Except on Yantif, there's some that we do. But what we're trying to do is and say is, now I'm in a very holy space. I can't be mundane anymore. I need to sort of elevate myself and enter that space that Hashem is sort of taking me to. So this is the great question, and this is where we're up to. He starts answering the question with an analogy. And what is the analogy that he answers the question with? That the king is heading towards his palace, and as he's heading towards his palace, what does he, he walks through the field first, and whoever chooses to come and greet the king in the field has now the opportunity, and what does he say? In the field, 
It's very casual. It's nothing fancy going on. I don't need protection. I don't need protection to come over to the king. He's there, and it's very casual. And he has a smiling face to everyone. And I sort of get to meet him there. And then he continues by saying, and then he moves on to the city, and then he goes into the palace. And of course, whoever, right? The analogy. So in the nimshal, it's more like if you come out and greet him in the field, you get swept along into the city and into the palace. And that's what Shoshana Yom Kippur. But the focus now is more of the Elul time, which is in the field. That's where we stopped, right? Yeah? You missed one class, but yeah. But that's basically where we were at. So we need, what we need to understand is, how is this mashal the answer to the question? So again, what's our question? Two things. How is it a sarusa dele tata? How is it an arousal from below? And two, how is it mundane and not holy? There's such a great revelation, right? And we see on Yom Kippur has the same revelation on the Yod Gidon Midas Rachman. Over and over in the Dami Yom Kippur, we say the Yod Gidon Midas Rachman, and Yom Kippur is the holiest day, right? We don't eat, we don't work, we, we're in shul, we don't wear leather shoes, right? All those stuff. So how is it different? Okay? So, where, can you tell me where we left off in the Mimer? What? Amazing. Okay. Oh, so the last thing we said, and that was the class that you missed, is that he says that what happens is, that's why the Jewish people, the nation is called Yisroel. Why? Did you get any more comfortable with it? Did you think about it? I remember you had a hard time with it. Yes, I did not think about it, to be honest with you. So sorry, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yisroel. Let's divide the word into three. We have a yod, we have sar, we have kel. What is, over here, he sort of wants to describe, what is the ultimate Jew? Okay, when I'm in alignment, okay, when I'm in bittel, when I'm in alignment with who I truly am, what does it look like? Who is my sar? What's the sar? Minister. Minister, whatever, the ruler. Who rules my life? Kel. How does he describe Kel? What's Kel? Source. That's God's name. That is the source. That is the first of the 13 attributes of compassion. But it, it, he explains it as the source of all light. Right? He said God is like that burning bush, and the light that comes forth is Kel. So he says, and the yud is what? Uh, Non-stop. Good. It's perpetual. So there's this constant, the Jew, when he it knows who he is, okay, when he could truly return to himself, to his truest self, he's in a state of that the kel is what rules him. He's in a state of bittel. That means, right, we're going to get to it more. Let, let's read what it's, what, how he explains it. Dehainu sheyesh bechol nefesh mi Yisrael. In every single Jew... There is a nisot elikos, a spark of godliness, mamish, literally speaking. Hamachaya nafshoi, that, that gives life to his soul, hello kiss, right? His, his nafshoi the kiss, his godly soul. Umosheikh b'tiv'o l'mala l'ar. Now what happens? Because I have this godly soul inside of me, and the godly soul comes from who? It's a piece of godliness itself. Automatically, right, the way it works even naturally, Every single thing wants to cling to its source. A child wants to be close to its mommy, right? They say, why, do, why, does, a flame, why does a flame face forward? I mean, it always flickers upwards. Why? Because it clings to go back to where it came from. So that is the, the, the soul, the godly soul. Moshe, it is, it drawns, it's pulled. Betiv'ay in its nature. Lemaila to go back up, le'ar to the light. Be'ar hachayim, which is the light of life. Limsor nafshoye lav yisbarach. To really, right, what's misirat nefesh? Limsor nafshoye. To give up his soul, a love yisbarach to Hashem. Vehu lemailu menachachma v'adash v'nafshoye. Right, this, this godliness and this needing to cling to it and yearning to be close to my source is something that is not based on intellect. Okay, if we're going to sit here and try to explain this according to our understanding, we won't really be able to put it into words. Why? Why not? 
Why not? All right, if you ask a child, a little one-year-old, why do you want to be close to your mommy? Do they have an answer for you? No, because it comes from inside. Because it's beyond understanding. It's just, that's what it is. It is what it is, okay? So it's not based on intellect or understanding. <coughs> so, but really we have to know, we, we're sitting here, we learn sit-ins, we learn about who we really are, we learn about what it means to be aligned with ourselves. But at the end of the day, there's a certain element of emunah, right, of, of faith, that we realize that really this whole idea is beyond our understanding. But it's something that we all feel inside of us, right? You know the famous story of, of a bunch of uh, Israeli soldiers, and they were in the middle of a war, and it was, I guess it was a quiet time, so they were sitting around, and they were having a debate, does God exist or not? And it was, a, it was quite a you know, um, he, heated debate. And then suddenly, uh, I don't know what hit, it, hit them. I read this from the, the soldier that was there. Suddenly, some, some kind of threatening thing came right towards them. And what, what do you think happened to all those people, all those soldiers that were just debating if God exists or not, they all start screaming, Shema Yisrael, Because at that, point, at that moment, what happened was, it's not like in that moment the soldiers started thinking, oh, actually God does exist, and therefore let me say Shema. No, 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 no. What happened at that moment was that their godly soul was exposed. And they were able to just really tap into it. And it's not about understanding or not. It's like, this is who I am. So you just scream it out. So that's what we have to realize. That it's not something. Because really, really, according to understanding, according to your intellect, then it's not something we could really grasp this whole idea to, to nullify yourself and to dedicate yourself, right? Lahafkir, to dedicate yourself completely to, right? We call the call the You're literally putting yourself completely aside and dedicating yourself to something higher than you. That really is not something that makes so much sense, okay? The mm Zehu, -hmm. and this is what it is, Bonim Atem Lavaya Eloketa. This is where he brings the analogy that you are the son Right? You are the child, right? Because going back to that mashal, ask the child, why is this person your father? I don't know. He's my father because he's my father. Okay? And I don't have to explain it to you. This is the concept that we are Hashem's children. Kibar, ki, kibara That means davua. Kibara kara mean, davua means that the child comes from the father. Hushenichal bertsono shal aviv blishom tam vidas. He's automatically included in the Ratzon, in the will of his father, without any reasoning. Just like a foot nullifies himself to the brain. So let me ask you a question, okay? Look at our body. The Rebbe uses this a lot to explain this concept of what it means to be bottled to Hashem, but not in a way of that I'm sacrificing something but rather in a way that I am a seamless conduit for godliness to, throw, to flow through me. So what's this whole idea? Batel ritzon cha, mipnei ritzono. You should nullify your ratzon before his. So yes, on a very simple note, it's like, okay, I'm going to put my wants and my needs aside, and I'm going to try to satisfy God's needs and wants. And I feel like that's a little bit what you were describing with the balance thing. There's God, and there's me. And I have my wants and my needs, and God has his wants and... I'm just saying when it's when you see it as two separate things, there's always that friction. What the Alter Rebbe wants, and what Hasidus wants so much, and he talks about it in so many places, is Bittel means that it's not me and him. It's that I am a continuation of his godliness. Godliness flows through me. I'm a vessel. So Batal Ritzon Khamipne Ritsono means that I'm just aligning and I'm realizing that really my truest desire is his desire. Just like the foot and the brain. What would happen? What would happen? Chas v'shalom, okay? And it does happen, and we know that those people are ill. If the foot says, you know what, brain, I'm fed up of you controlling my life and you telling me what to do. Today, I'm not going to listen to you. What would happen? Two things. First of all, the person can't function that way. 
because there's a seamless flow, right? The foot seamlessly follows the brain and, and we're connected. It's not like I have my agenda, you have your agenda, and we're like, need to work this out. And now today I'm not in the mood. That's one. So there's no seamless flow, so you can't function. Two, what happens to the foot? If the foot disconnects from the brain, what happens to the foot? It's just a piece of flesh. It's dead. It, 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 it's not, it doesn't have anything now, right? So what's the point? It's like I could say, God, you know what? I'm really not in the mood. And my desires don't line, align up with your desires. And I'm just going to do my own thing. That's beautiful. And you can live your life that way. But you're not alive because you're not connected to the source of all life. And not more than that. You're not connected to who you truly are. Because who you truly are is your truest, most innermost desires are really, really one with God's desires. Now, why don't we feel it? Why don't we feel it? Blockages. Very simple. There's at, and we're going to get in Parag Bays, it's fascinating how the Alter Rebbe goes and takes us to the blockages. And he says how to deal with it. Where did you lose the life? Where did you lose the life? So let's just finish Parag Aleph. So just like the foot, right? The, the, the foot is really happiest when it follows the brain's orders. Okay? V'zehu batal ritzaincha mipnei ritzaina. And this is what it means, that you should nullify your ratzon before his ratzon. Shebichdei sheya'ir el ha'adam mechinas pnimis ritzaina. In order for God's most innermost desires and will, in order for that to be uh, shining through you as a person, what has to happen? He needs to nullify all his desires. That he should have no other independent desire whatsoever. Okay? So, I think it's important to notice that the source of all issues is only one source. And the minute I can deal with that source, besides for the blockages, that's what we're going to, that's, that's a lifetime work. But what's the, what's the mindset? The mindset is that I see myself as something separate from godliness. I don't see myself as one with God. Remember when we spoke about the animal soul and the godly soul, the difference between the two? The animal soul has all its issues and all its defense mechanisms and survival mechanisms be simply because it thinks that it's a, a, a separate identity. And therefore it needs to survive. And therefore it needs to th like think, it, like I, this is the only way I could survive. But my godly soul, which I have to get in touch with, and now is the time because God is giving us this opportunity. He's shining a light that I could rediscover myself. The godly soul knows that it's one with God. And when it's one with God, it's almost like I don't have to tell you to nullify your desires. It's almost like it's obvious. God, I want what you want because we're one. Okay? There's a seamless flow. I'm a conduit for godliness. Yes. How does this idea of not seeing yourself separate from godliness connect to what we talked about in one of the first classes of, of hum humanity and being human is holy in itself? Great question. And that is, the reason why we say that is because humanity is something that God gave us and it's something that what, what Hasidus really wants is the integration of both. Both, right? We don't, we don't want to look at the animal soul and run away from it and pretend like it's not there and, and sort of like say, you're bad and I don't want to ever deal with you and get out of my life. And I'm just, that doesn't work. That backfires. When I could look at my humanness and even my animal soul, right, in Tanya, what's the ultimate? When I can actually teach my animal soul, by the way, I have a better way for you to survive and thrive. And the godly soul teaches the animal soul and that's when the animal soul helps the godly soul in its relationship with Hashem, in its service of Hashem. So I think when we can change that mindset, and you see, a lot of times we think the ego convinces us the fact that you're a human is a bad thing, then I'm never going to embrace it and give it what it needs. It just needs to be seen. That's it. Once it's seen, 
Now I could teach it how to really live life and how to be happy. But if I'm always running away from it and denying it and suppressing it, it just comes back to haunt you. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So you should know that when I started learning Chassidus, this was probably the biggest game changer. Like from what I was used to in my upbringing is you're human. It's like, oh, you know? And the minute I can embrace that and hold it and see it and accept it, it's, it's really beautiful. I'm not fighting it. I'm not denying it. I'm not, I'm not repressing it. Because you see, as long as you're living in this world, you're human. So how can I take it and use it for good rather than fight it, fight it, fight it, fight it? You know what Dr. Rabbi says about fighting? When a, when, a, when a clean man fights with a dirty man, he gets dirty. So instead of fighting with the animal soul, let me train it and teach it. And let me become his friend and sort of bring him into the godly soul and, and, and elevate him and integrate the two. And now I could serve Hashem with both my hearts, both my animal soul and my godly soul. That's why in Shema we say, with two hearts, two souls. So the Alter Rebbe explains, because that is the godly soul and the animal soul. The, the, the ultimate goal is that my animal soul learns to serve God too. And what's amazing is that, <laughs> that the animal soul has passion. It has certain characteristic, character traits that the godly soul doesn't have. So we have what to gain from the animal soul. Understand? Amazing. But, oh, I'm not going to learn with you, but it's, it's something that's for sure going to come up again. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Beautiful. So when we talk about animal soul, we need to understand the animal soul is, is not bad. It's a neutral. I want to eat like an animal. The animals are not bad. It's survival. So if a person decides to eat as a gluttony and to um, eat it in a disgusting way only for this pure satisfaction of food, that's one thing. That's being an animal and allowing yourself to engage um, your animal soul and give it a lot of power. But if you would say to yourself, well, why did God give me this desire for food? I need food for fuel so I can sit here in class today and study. So the animal soul is just helping, like you said, which is so important. The animal soul is passionate. It's like a raging bull. So if you would take a bull and put him out in, into the field, it will plow the field and do a great job. But if you're going to put him into a china, into a, you know, they say the bull in the china, it's going to destroy everything. You have to know how to direct it. But the animal soul isn't bad. That's why we're, we're not fighting with it. We're just trying to elevate it to a place where it also wants what, what the godly soul wants. But we don't want to get rid of that passion. What do we do without the passion? Do you imagine a person without passion? doesn't want to stay in bed a whole day. doesn't want to do anything. But, but they don't you. fight it. Beautiful, yeah. Okay, we finished Parak Aleph, and really all of you should be raising your hand and saying, Tippi, we didn't answer the question. Right? <laughs> Did we answer the question? Nope. Is it a Sarvus of the Satsas or a Sarvus of the Leila? And why is Elul not a Yom Tavim Shabbos? How does the fact that Hashem, the Melech, the King, come into the field answer the question? Any insight? Um, two yes. more questions? Sorry. Who wants to go first? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Okay. Is it about mixing the physical with the, that Hashem wants you to dwell in this world with the, the uplift the physicality is that why that's a, that's a beautiful concept and it's very true but it's not specifically okay. connected to this yes i was about to clarify you mean the answer to two of these questions we is said that, that the muscle of the king in the field is the answer to these two questions okay. and how is it the answer is there a revelation now of the yod given yes absolutely so is it an extraordinary time now yes absolutely so, why are we sitting here in school with our weekday clothes, writing, doing 39 malafos, right? It seems like it's an ordinary time. So is it extraordinary or is it ordinary? We can make it extraordinary. But this is where Isar Sabda Asata comes in. Awesome. Let's see. Let's hear. How? Like Hashem gives us like this kind of potential for, for a holy month. But as we talk about, we have to make the initiation we have to initiate this connection with awesome. we have so to the extraordinariness if i could say that word is coming from who us excellent that's one that what happens here is that hashem coming into the field means 
that God meets us in our zone, where we're at. You see, Shabbos and Yantif, and even a wedding and a chuppah, remember we said it's the dating process. What's the difference between the date and the wedding? Imagine if you would go out on a date with a guy and come in a collar gown. Why are you all laughing? What's wrong? We're coming together, we're dating. Dating is, is quite extraordinary, you know why? There is an element where we're coming together to discover if we want to commit ourselves to each other and live the rest of our life together. That's quite extraordinary, quite similar to what happens by a wedding. But what's the dating process? The dating process is more casual. It's more like, of course, we want to really get to know each other in a very deep way, but in a more casual kind of way, okay? So, Shabbos and Yantif, Hashem takes us and elevates us to a, higher, to a higher place, and we have to abstain from work because it's like eating ice cream under the chuppah. Would you eat ice cream under the chuppah? No, because the chuppah is a holy time, so I'm not eating ice cream here. Okay, but can you eat ice cream on a date? Yes. I don't know if I recommend it, but like, you can, okay? I'm not a dating coach. <laughs> okay, so, so what's happening here? Okay, there's a, uh, there's a joke that uh, a couple in their 90s came to live in a home, in assisted living, and uh, the nurse that was appointed to their room hears the husband say, sweetie, darling, my love, the whole time, he's just calling her baby, just really, really nice, and he was like amazed. He's never seen this in a 90-year-old after all these years. And one day, the wife, you know, left, I think, she, I don't know, she had an appointment. So the nurse comes to the husband and he says, listen, I have to hear. How is it that after all these years, you're still calling her darling, sweetie, honey? So the husband, so the husband says, oh, I just forgot what her name is. <laughs> Um, but the point is, the point is that to call your wife honey, sweetie, darling in that first year of marriage, right, in the Shonari Shona, is not, it's like, okay, like that makes sense, right? The extraordinariness is, I just made up a word, I'm sorry, is that when after 70 years of marriage, or I'm ready to shun by all of you, whatever, I don't know what the, the number makes sense, but... It, that's when I'm still calling you darling. That's when it's ex really extraordinary because it's like when you're going on a honeymoon, right? A husband and wife on a honeymoon, it's like you're not fighting on a honeymoon, right? It's like you're in a, you're in a special circumstance and over here we act differently. The, the specialty of Elul is where the circumstances don't change, but who changes? Which I change. In other words, in all the struggles that I have, and in all my darkness and my issues and my the, all the things that I need to do tshuva, in that space I rediscover myself and I become a new person. That's the essence of tshuva. Okay, so it's like very nice on Yom Kippur. You're in shul. Of course, at that moment there's no sin in your mind, right? Because it's like this is an elevated time. I'm praying, I'm fasting, right? That's beautiful, and there's a time for that. But we're talking about HaMelech Basadeh. Hashem comes to you where you're at. So the question is, who's doing the work here? Do the circumstances change, like Shabbos Ayantif? No. But still there's a great revelation. It's almost like God is shining a flashlight on you, exposing the truth to you so that you can tap into it and rediscover yourself and become a new person. So that answers two questions. Why is it mundane? And how is the Isra Sadal Asata and not Isra Sadal Aid? It answers both questions. I want to make sure you understand. How does it answer both questions? Why is it mundane? Because the circumstances don't change. But we are changing in our in our struggles, in our dirt, in our field, we rediscover ourselves. And how is that as the Rusa Vulsata? Well, it is, because it's your work. It's not God elevating you. It's you telling God, God, I want to rediscover. I want to become a new person. Help me. I want to come, I want to come back to you. I, want to, I, 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 I see who I really am. 
You know, there's a story. You probably know the story. It's a beautiful it's a, story. You blow the opportunity, though. Totally. You just blow it. He's in the field, and we just blow it. Yeah. Right. They say fair. Life as usual. Nothing's, I don't feel anything. I'm not doing anything. So you just miss the entire month. You don't have to go out to the field. That's what we discussed. Right you can stay home. And you don't do anything. Right. Don't That's also part of it. Right. God is walking through the field, and you don't have to go out. Right. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. The story goes that I don't know who it was, but uh, I, what a, I forgot his name. Maybe I don't know. He was traveling, and there's a certain um, there's a certain um, stringency that some people take. It comes from some of the one of the Rishonim. He writes that once you leave your house to travel somewhere, you shouldn't go back home before you got to your destination. You know the story. Yeah, it's an awesome story. Alright, thank you. And he and something his flight was cancelled. I don't know, he couldn't get where he where he needed to go, but he didn't want to go back home because you're not supposed to. So he called the Rebbe secretary and um, I believe it was Rabbi Kharikov and Rabbi Kharikov asked the Rebbe and so listen to the Rebbe's answer. The Rebbe answered and I have a solution for you. You should sit down and learn a parak of Tanya. And then, after you learn the parak of Tanya, you're a new person. And when you're a new person, you can go back home. Because it's a different person that wanted to travel to the person that now learned the parak of Tanya and can go back home. And this part I never heard, but I heard it again now, that the next morning he got another phone call from Rabbi Kharikov, and he tells him, the Rebbe said you should know, that what he said, he meant literally. So that's the opportunity of El, where you see, it's not like, you don't have to like run away from yourself. You're not going to a different space like Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. You're actually still very human, going back to that human thing. You're in the field. It's like God comes to us and says, I see you the way you are. It's on your terms, it's in your zone. But I have to know that with all my struggles and with all my challenges, I have the opportunity to start anew, to rediscover who I really, truly am. Okay? That is the summation of Parag Aleph. Okay? I believe we have a few more minutes to go into Parag Base. Parag Base is so, so beautiful, so open your mind. Okay. Vihine. Yesh ba'adam b'chinas ir Moshav. So every person has the concept of a settled city, ubechina sadeh, and the concept of a field, umidbar, and a desert. So it's very interesting, and it could be a little confusing because the author is sort of now jumps to another whole thing. He says, "Forget about the field. We're going to get back to that soon." Now he wants to introduce to us the concept of a desert. So each one of us has within us the experience of. A settled city, a field, and a desert. And what are they? What does what, what do they mean? Midbar he erets leizarua. The midbar, the desert, is a is a piece of land that's not plowed. It doesn't have growth in it. Shehem hamaisim. What is that spiritually speaking? Those are your actions, the hadiburim and your speech, the hamachshaves and your thoughts. Asher loy lahashem ehema. They are not godly. They're not for Hashem. Ain Sarachlemar Impgam. Not only is it Impgam that you damage the Bimakshava Dibor Maisa, that means your thought, speech, and action was completely not godly. He says, not only is it referring to that, Ella Afilu Gam in Yadi Hatter. Even permissible things, Rakshahem in Yanim Shainam Trikam La Vedas Hashem. But they're not. They're not needed for your service of God. Okay, so they're not forbidden. They are permissible, but you're sort of being... Not necessary. What? They're permissible, but not necessary. Right, not necessary, or you didn't, you, you're not using it for your godly service. Udvarim the Talim, and also, uh, what's the word? Udvarim the Talim, like, uh, what's the English translation for that? Um... The barn and Talim are, are words of vanity, yeah? And nonsensical things. Yeah, like nonsense. Exactly. 
Hare lav orcha de malka lashtaya bemile de hadyuta. This is a Aramaic verse, and it says it is not the way of the king to speak in peasant language. Okay? The zehu asher lo yashav adam sham. So the, the desert is a place that a person doesn't dwell there, right? We know that. Maybe Bedouins. But like the regular standard person doesn't dwell in the in the in the in the desert. Okay? Perosh meaning Adam who commits a cause of the Al Dumos Hakise. The most Kamara Adam. Really, right, the whole concept of Adam is really Right, we say the reason why did God call Adam Adam? Where did the name Adam come from? What does Adam mean? Adam, like taken from Adam. Okay, great. So the first reason is because Adam, a man, um, and Adama means earth, and and the first man was created. Part of him, his body was created from the earth, right? But another reason why Adam is called Adam is because Adame leElion, right? What does that mean? Similar to that. Good. Right, Adame le Elyon. So Adame, even in Hebrew, I believe, right, Demui is similar to. We were created in the image of God. So when the Altar Abba says that when it says that a person doesn't dwell in the desert, he says not only you as a human being, but the person can also be referring to the Demus Hakise, which is God. Okay? That because there's a certain, uh, right, the, the, the person is created in the image of Hashem, so there's, in a certain sense, we can call God and Adam also. Okay? So, that God also has, in a certain sense, a, a mare, a, like a, like you, and an, an, uh, a mare means of the look of, of uh, Adam, a person, the guy, right? He can't sit there. One second. God only dwells in the Mikdash. Ve'asuli Mikdash, Hashem says, you should make for me a Mikdash, a resting place. Ve'shachanti, and I will dwell betocham in there. In other words, this place of the desert where your thought, speech, and action are either completely contrary to godliness, or they are mundane, that means they're just going to waste, or, or they are, uh, yeah, those two things, God doesn't dwell there. God dwells in the Mishkan. Mishkan means in, a holy, in the holy place. Yeah, you had a question. <coughs> yeah, but that would have meant. Again, <coughs> I, that we are, what does it mean? That we were created in the image of Hashem. Okay. In other words, they are, I'm trying to prove to you that the Adam, lo yashav sham, that a person doesn't dwell in the desert, is referring to Hashem, that Hashem can dwell in the desert, in the place where, you know, you're not, your intentions are not godly. Okay? Wait, and we say that Hashem can't dwell there because Adam and Yon, because we similar no, to... No, a person doesn't dwell in the desert. Okay. And the al says on a deeper note, it's referring to the ultimate person who is Hashem. Hashem. Okay? Any questions before we move on? Let's do five more minutes, okay? Um, the Eitza, Hayautza Lezach. Okay, so now, what is the altar of a sort of bringing up over here? Because now he's going to say, I'm going to give you the best advice of this desert issue. So first of all, what is this desert issue? What's a desert? Speech, actions, and thoughts that are not godly. Okay, and, and, and why can't a person live there? Because by that he's not feeling his purpose. Like, that's not the person. Why not? Good. Why because can't a person live in the desert? <laughs> he's not connected to the source of life, right? Let's say physically, what does a person need in order to survive? Water, food. Water, food, shelter, right? And in the desert, it's almost like you're missing all of these basic elements. So in the desert, you're not connected to the source of life, and therefore a person can dwell in the desert. But spiritually speaking, if you're disconnected from your source to the point where your thought, speech, and action is disconnected from it too, you can't really survive there. And not only that, he says 
that, you see, he takes us to the desert. What happened? Why are we not in the field anymore? Why are we now in the desert? Because the desert is a more extreme form. It's in the desert, you forgot completely who you are. You're completely lost. Okay? Now, it, it makes sense because the only reason why my thought, speech, and action are not godly is because I forgot who I am. Mm -hmm. Right? I have this blockage that doesn't allow me to feel my godly soul. I'm not aligned with who I truly am. And therefore, my thought, speech, and action is now very separate from godliness. And I have my own agenda in life. And I'm so disconnected. So what is the Alter Rebbe's advice to deal with this issue? Okay? This is beautiful. Va'etza hayauta. One minute, I lost the place. Yeah, right, but I'm, I'm saying it. Um, oh, va'etza hayauta is that, and the advice for this is he needs to be kashem misham, and you should search from there et havaya elokecha, Hashem your God. There's a, a story. Um, you know Chalm, right? You know the Chalm jokes. Are you aware of the Chalm jokes? Okay, Chalm is a city. I don't know how it happened because actually I heard that it was actually a city of very smart people, yeah. right? But I, for some reason, there are jokes about Chalm, Chalm as in people that are not so smart. So there are many, many jokes. So the joke is said of uh, two, you know, that a guy is walking in the street of Chalm and it's dark outside, it's night. And they used to have these like lanterns like here and there every few minutes in Chalm on the streets. And so a guy is walking down the street and he sees another guy by the lantern, searching for something. And he says, what are you looking for? So he says, I lost the key to my house. So he says, okay, and you're looking here? He says, yeah, did, where did you lose it? Oh, I lost it a few blocks down. So the guy's like, oh, so then why are you looking here? So he says, because here there's light, okay? But this is a perfect analogy of what the author is saying here. He's saying like this, you lost your light somewhere. And the reason why you lost your light, it could be that it was completely not even your fault. Just life itself, okay? You lost your light. You forgot at some point. You forgot who you are. The problem is that we don't like to go back to the dark place to look where we lost the light. We rather look for it in the light. But he's saying, You have to go back to where you lost it. You have to go back to dark places. That's not comfortable. Okay, we're gonna stop here and continue with Hashem tomorrow. It's a pleasure. Tippi, can I ask something? Something? Sure. That was um. Just see the depth of the work. Just not so. You read it on your own. You can't understand it. And you're a wonderful teacher. Thank you. I don't understand the darkness. Like, if you go, you have to go back, then you want to go forward and just do chupa. You can only go forward when we could go back. What's therapy? Same idea. It's like the author said it 300 years ago. That you have to be able to go back to where you lost the light. And once you're able to go back, now you could now you could now you reclaim your light and now you can move forward and now you have the light. That's a blockage. Yes. The blockage happened when you lost your light. So you sort of have to go back there, repair what happened there, and now you're a new person. Will we will we discuss what does like literally mean going back to a dark place? Yes. Okay. I'm a biggie on that. We'll get to it tomorrow. <laughs> What a question. Yeah. Sorry. It was really confusing to me how the altar of it describes the Midbar here <clears throat> as opposed to when we talk about Chet uh, Aglim. And we say, Dafka there, the desert represented closeness to Godness because there's nothing there, no distractions. They could only direct their attention towards God and they didn't want to leave that. And yeah. that's why they came up back with a bad report, right? For sure. So that's now we're saying true. that. But that was a time in the desert where God literally took them under their arms. He gave them man. I mean, where do we ever have that I don't need to eat food and God just gives me food in the desert? And it was a preparation for Masim Torah. But obviously, the Jews didn't stay in the desert forever. That wasn't the place of dwelling. 
it was as a prep to go into Eretz Yisrael to get the Torah and then to go into Eretz Yisrael. But for sure, we see there that God took them under their wing, right? Hi. Hi. Esther's after you. So you have another few minutes. I I'm done. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> you said when you started learning the series. Oh, should I tell you my story? I didn't grow up for that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I'm so glad. So what happened? I what happened was 